So Homebrewed Sec, it's, it's your show, man. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? We can. Are you going to engage your webcam? Um, yes, I will. Okay. Perfect. Right. Okay. Um, quarantine life is interesting, so change of plans. Instead of doing this in the kitchen with a full demo, I am now in a nursery. As you can see, crib back there. Not my normal office space, but uh, we're, we're flexible. So, um, PowerShell and pickling. Um, if I'm being honest, I did not think this would be an accepted talk. I just thought it was a funny alliteration, and it was two things that I knew that both started with P, and it, it, I'm, I'm glad it took off, um, and I've had a really good response from it so far. So um, this is supposed to be introductory, so if you know much about PowerShell or pickling, um, this may be basic, but I hope there's something for everyone in here. Um, Okay, but I'm gonna, this is gonna be pretty, nothing on the slides. This is just for a bit in the background. Um, I, I'm going to, um, if you look on PowerShell Pickles, the hashtag or Homebrew Tech, or I'll have my website um, at the end, you will see, I'll, I'll post um, the resources for you to get more information on all of this, um, as well as my GitHub with some PowerShell resources. So. I'm gonna go to demo mode, open up Notepad++. Um, like I said, this is 100% demo here. Um, I'm gonna show hopefully basics, um, but some of this may be a little more advanced. So PowerShell, um, we think of this a lot in for Windows um, as a sysadmin. I use it every day. I tell people all the time that Microsoft is trying to make it harder and harder to use their GUIs. And if you want to use, if you want to get the information you need, you need to use PowerShell. Um, but it's not just for Windows sysadmins. You could use it with Linux. This is not going to cover Linux at all because I have never installed PowerShell on Linux, but it is useful and most of these same concepts will work. Um, but I so so for me as a Windows sysadmin, what I'm using all all day long. Let me increase this zoom quite a bit. Um, what is that? That is going to be okay. Um, so every every command in PowerShell starts with a verb. That verb in a lot of cases is going to be get or there there's a list online i will post it of all of the the verbs there's get add remove um search things like that um so something that i use all the time is get ad computer or get ad user for active directory i'm not going to go into that but there's a ton you can do with it um what i will do is and if you have a Windows computer, PowerShell is, is open for you there all the time. Um, okay. So I'm going to, something that's extremely useful is get child item. Um, honestly, LS and DIR will do exactly the same thing. They're all, um, they're all aliased, but I'm going to call it get child item for right now because this is PowerShell and it shows you get is your verb and child item is is your noun, what you're trying to get. So um, you, they're, they're set child item as well. That's a lot. That's not going to come into play. But so, okay, get child item. Um, If, if, as you see in my initial get child item, there's not very much information here. But if I do get child item FL format list, but then if I don't specify what I want in, you know, I'm gonna spell it out for you all because, um, again, I, I'm so used to aliasing, but 
FL will be a lot easier for you, but format list, um, you get everything. It'll show you literally all of your commands, um, all, all of the attributes that you can pull. And that's really useful if you don't know the command lit much and you don't know what you could be getting from it. Because if you don't know what information you're trying to parse, then FL will just tell you every single thing that you can get and then you can you can pull from there. Um, now, for me, I would do a lot of where, you know, name, like something. But I personally think if you're learning and you're just trying to get information, the easiest thing is to export to CSV and ex and then you can parse in, in Excel. Um, and then, but you can do a lot of the same things in the command line. Um, okay, so that's just very, um, so so where is, is essentially your one-liner, um, is your one-liner equivalent of if. So where, and, and then this, um, this variable right here, that underscore, means where the item from, from the pipe before. So this is where everything that I got in child item, um, and it's gonna do essentially a for each loop and, and sort, or an if rather, and you, you know, sort on name. And you may be used to other programming languages where you have equal, 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 things like that. PowerShell is going to be EQ or like or not equals. Again, I'm not trying to go in depth with that. I'm gonna send you to resources at the end on my website, but um, you, you treat this very much like an if block. So I've, I've shown you a bit of the of PowerShell scripting here in, in the PowerShell console. But the other side of PowerShell is .ps1s, is your actual command list that you can write. Um, this is a fairly simple example here that I'm going to um, just pick out a few, a few things that I've done in this command commandlet that can apply to other things. So um, parameters, every Every PowerShell command that you use, for example, that, that get child item, it's going to have parameters. Now, if, you, if I ran this, I could tab complete and get all of my parameters. But um, this is so for inputs. I really like to add parameters so that I can universalize the, the script that I'm writing. If you don't have these, then you have then someone has to come in and, and change the actual script instead. If you have a parameter, you can change it on the fly in the command line. You can say, ah, this time I want to send an email. This time I want to run no output to console. This time I want it to just report only. Um, and what this script is, is an Active Directory cleanup process. That's not important. I'm just gonna show you a few of the decision logics in here and a few of the things that you can do with PowerShell through this. So um, you see all these, these parameters up here. Um, and I, I didn't cover it at the beginning, but one of the things I love about PowerShell and why it's my language of choice is that this is plain language. Um, there, there's there's no obfuscation here. Commandlet binding, uh, you're doing binding for your commandlet. Param, I assume that's parameter. Parameter mandatory is false. This is a switch, it's quiet. There, There's no abbreviations, there's no anything, this is, this is clear language and I just think that this is, I, I like to use PowerShell even in times where something like Python may work better because a lot of sysadmins use it. It's a lot more universal. It's installed on almost every Windows computer, which is great if you're trying to live off the land as a red teamer. Um, I'm blue team all the way, so I don't fully think that way. But to me, I, I use that same live off the land concept to just think if I write something in PowerShell, then it's a little more universally ex, um, used because now I can hand this to any sysadmin and chances are they know some amount of PowerShell. Hey, it's, and it's a lot easier. Can you by chance zoom in a little bit? I've got a few people in the questions here that are asking if you can like do the little mouse. Yeah, totally. Um, winning. Yeah. Yeah. So, cause it, 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 I'm sure it looks great on your screen, but like coming across. No, absolutely. Um, so. Okay. 
how how much more is that good um i know i my uh, eyes are yeah that looks phenomenally better thank you thank you okay so so i'm going to cover a few a few things then um that i just very quickly let this is the example that i was saying where parameter mandatory false it's it's literally that simple this you know the, the dollar sign if you're not familiar with um with much scripting is for variable um but it, it just it, it makes sense you can read that and even without too much knowledge know what that means and that's just why i like powershell and it's it's really a great introductory language and it's really good and universal for it and infosec so um something that that takes place in almost all of my scripts is get date um and those can be super easy to manipulate um add days and then so this days disable up there is my is one of my um input parameters um so this is exactly what it's saying and part of what i'm gonna trying to do here more than even teach because 20 minutes um is probably not going to teach anyone from the basics i want to show that this could be easy that this is something you can pick up and play with and thing something that you can do something practical with so so what does this do um today so it calls back to today so it's get date add days minus days disable so if you wanted to just specify it manually and say you, you could even do this in one line you could do get date add days minus 30 you just want things older than well actually at this point it's this is not telling you if you want it before or after you don't have a greater than or less than all you have in this case is i have a date that's minus 30 days um and again you can see in a lot of ways this is how i'm specifying my parameters there's nothing magical about up here except for this is just something to get you from user land and command the the command into script land so um this is where i'm parsing everything i'm putting log file so um this is something that i will put this function generate output that i actually originally got from got from paul cunningham um the uh exchange server pro guy this is extremely useful if you're doing anything where you're making a change um i've just seen too many times when you're making a powershell script and i have no idea why it's doing that but you don't have any way of of fully testing it this if you're running something on a schedule this output will um it, you can output to script you can output to in this case i in this one i do not have email but in the one that i put on my website and on github i will have the output to email as well and this is just a very easy you can plop this into any script and then in your parameters you can say quiet you can say whichever you want and and pop pop this out to a log file um and so this is how easy it could be to manipulate that's i think maybe a little bit small i'm gonna zoom one more time um so so this right here how it's um writing to a log file timestamp and that timestamp is from up there it just parses a get date into human readable date instead of you know unix timestamp or whichever the default is and then log entry is from up here um which is input from the command line i'll show you in a second where where i input log entry but then you you could write anything in here you could just say you know test output and out out file to file.txt and that append just means add to the end if i didn't have append it would overwrite the whole file that's how easy you can write a file in powershell in, in powershell it's just out file um so um now i'm not going to go too much into these this is more like i said the um the, this is for active directory modification but functions are really useful um 
if I was doing a PowerShell much more advanced class, I would talk about writing functions into modules. Um, for, for right now, um, functions are great if you're going to run the same code more than once, pull it out so that if you ever make a change to, to this, you can make a change in one place and it essentially cascades instead of then having to make that change in 10 different places. So, um, and in this, I call back to my, my generate output. So I'm gonna go down, show you some um, different ways to make decisions in decision trees, you know, ifs, try, catch. So um, I'll get to the for each loop down there because that's, I mean, I have never ran a script, written a script that did not have for each. Um, Okay, so this is in my initialization. Initialization, honestly, in power, newer versions of PowerShell four and beyond, you don't even need to add the modules. But I like to make my scripts as um, universal as possible. So what I mean there is that in my PowerShell console here, you, there's tons of um, command. There's tons of modules out there that you can input, uh, that you can import. There's Active Directory things like that. Now, if, and I don't actually have the R set tools, the Active Directory tools on my computer, so I can't add this right now, but just showing you an example. Now in modern versions of PowerShell, if I just run a command, um, get a D computer, and I know that's probably small, um, but get a D computer, if I run that, and it, it, PowerShell will automatically check the module and import that. So just as, so for here, um, I'm, this isn't as important what it's doing, but I would just want to show you some decision um, logic. So here, this essentially says if this is not true. So if get module, if if we get module where object and it's empty, that's what this is. It's essentially a not equals. That's what the um, exclamation. Uh, the shift one there, a capital one, um, would, it means if that doesn't exist. So if you get module and there's no modules for Active Directory, well, you could do a lot of different things there. You could do if date equals this, you could do a ton of things. Um, so try, it's gonna try to run this. But again, you could do a lot of different things in try, you could modify something. Um, I haven't shown anything in modification right now because I'm just trying to show you basics um, and then catch. If it doesn't, if this fails, catch is going to run. Um, exit means that the script is going to stop running. Um, and I know I'm, I'm glossing over things very fast. I'm just trying to give a, a demo and I do want to get to the fun stuff. Um, I, I want to get to the pickling as well. Um, so for each. Um, I up there have OU, that's for organizational unit, but you could do anything. Um, let me actually, let, let me write something from, from scratch for a moment so you can see kind of my logic in writing a script. So um, array equals, and I'm going to fill in an array. One, two, three. Um, and then if you do for each number in array, oh, typo there, and that number does not exist yet, that is saying as, so each of these arrays will now become, every number in array will become a number in the resulting um, for each loop here. Um, what I like to do so, in a lot of my scripts is call this numbers instead of array because it, it again, it just plays into the natural language format of PowerShell that you can see for each number in numbers. It makes sense. So you could do just as simple as you could do math, you could do a lot of different things. I'm just for the purpose of simplicity going to echo number. 
and I'll show you how this will actually run. Um, get numbers. That's verb, that's your noun, and then and then that's probably way big, but And I, that CLS close, I like to just close my screen and, and clean and sanitize. Often uh, it helps with my ADD, my ADHD not getting distracted. So get numbers. And there's a ton of other things you could do. You could say, you could do echo the number is Um, that's, you know, fairly simple, but it shows you what you can do with a for each. Um, if you want to then say if, and this seems probably silly in such a simple script, but if number greater than one, obviously the easiest way to do that would be to have just pulled two, pulled one out of here, but showing some manipulation you can do and now it's just going to show you two and three so um and you could do modification you could do math you could do other things to this um but that for each will save you in so many different things um just it, it there's so many different things you can parse with it um i'm going to show you this is a bit more um This was something that I wrote, and this is a really practical problem that you can solve, generating passwords. Um, I was doing this for a lab that I was giving, and I wanted to generate a bunch of some easily memor memorable numbers, uh, passwords rather. So I based this on the EFF um, script, the EFF um, list. There's, I think it's 30,000 words in here. Uh, now it looks like 7,777 words. Um, and I say I want my password length to be nine characters. Um, and then this is an example of every character that I want to append to it. I import my password file where the word length is longer than that length. And this is get, this get random is not great um i encourage you to to play around with it but if you do get random five times in a row you may get three of the same number um the seeding is not great there are some things you can do to it but uh it's not worth it if you're trying to do anything for a real password don't don't use this but if you're using something for a temporary password like a lab um this is great but get random is not it's not a true uh it's not a, not true random. Um, and then this is just blanking out word one. Um, so I'm, I, I don't need to fully get into all this because I want to get into the fun pickling stuff. But um, this is actually a, a cool problem that, that you could solve. And I'm, I'm planning today, if I have the time to finish it, to put a blog post on essentially how to start this problem and give people a project to kind of start. Because this, as you can see, it's 13 lines. Um, it, it's a fairly easy thing to do, and it's a good problem to tackle. So I'm gonna throw my my background up here, and then shift for a moment. Um, excuse me as I get my station set up. Um, and I say pickling, what I really mean is, is fermenting here. I'm going to show you a basic ferment and then talk about some other things that we could ferment, but I'm going to show you one of my favorite easy things to do. I keep saying the word easy. Um, I don't mean that in a minimizing any way. I just mean I'm trying to show how this can be something you can do on your own. 
in your time free time right now. So while I'm chopping and hopefully not um, chopping my my fingers. Okay. All right. Wow, this feels like a real cooking demonstration. So um, do not follow my my cooking lead. You really should, if you're chopping, you you should bare your knuckles like that. I'm not great at it, but um, so ginger bug is what I'm making here. I'm gonna start with two fingers of ginger. Um, that's a bit bigger of a finger, um, but it works. Pickling in most cases is not precise. Um, the only case is when you're adding salt, you should add 2% and this recipe doesn't call for salt. I'll talk for a couple in, in a couple minutes on things that do require salt, um, like actual pickles. And like I said, I'm using the words pickling and fermenting interchangeably. Um, a lot of people hey, will take gonna, this again. Go ahead. Real quick, okay, if you're uh, if you're just on pickling and that's the only slide you've got, go ahead and kill your uh, screen there so the webcam goes cool. to the screen. Ah, perfect. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I have I have one in a second that I may throw up with okay. some proportions, but um, perfect. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. That looks good. Is the yep. lighting good enough? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the skin on that ginger, a lot of people peel it. Um, I will only peel it if there's a blemish. Um, there isn't really on here. But what you're trying to do is get all the bacteria you can. Um, now, if this has been in my fridge for a week, I'm peeling the crap out of that because there's junk from all the stuff sitting in your fridge. I'm, I'm going to peel it. But this has been sitting, it hasn't been sitting in my fridge. It's it's in a place where I trust the macrobacteria. Um, so, um, another, a thing, if, if I was downstairs and, in a blender, what I'd probably do is chop this into chunks about like this, throw this into the blender and just let it whiz instead. Let's do this really, really rough. You're, you're just trying to get the surface, um, the surface area so that the bacteria and water and sugar can all interact and that the bacteria can be coaxed out of here. So I, I said bacteria a few times, um, especially in the world we're living in right now where we're sanitizing our hands every few seconds, bacteria may sound scary, um, but there are good and bad bacteria. There's, um, in this case, we're trying to get beneficial bacteria out of here, but there are obviously tons of bacteria out there that are not good. There's E. coli, there's things like that that you can think of. Um, and they they work in very similar ways. Um, I, I'm not even going to go into the health benefits of all this, although I believe there are many. What I love about bacteria is that these, that there are millions of bacteria in a, maybe even trillions in just a quarter inch by quarter inch cube like that. I say quarter inch by quarter inch, but that is not a perfect cube. Um, so there, in, in, for example, in a tablespoon of sauerkraut, you get a trillion um, cells, uh, CFUs actually, colony forming units of bacteria. And that's amazing to me because there's living creatures in here and I have no control over what they do. I can coax them. I can move them towards what I want them to do, but no two ferments are ever going to taste the same because the bacteria are going to respond and, and actually respond because they are living creatures to the conditions that you give them. So, um, if I had, you know, patience, I'd go a lot finer. You really don't need to. You're going to strain this at the end. So I'm gonna go in the big jar and there's gonna be a lot, and this is this is a quart size mason jar. If you don't have mason jars, I, I'm not encouraging anyone to go to the store to get anything they don't have right now. If you cook a jar of tomato sauce, use that, clean it out. Um, also, I highly recommend that you fully clean your hands because like I was talking about bacteria, um, if you have any nasty bacteria, bathroom bacteria or things, they're just going to expand and expand in this ferment. Um, okay, and as I say that, I'm going to, to I'm going to throw all this in here. 
Um, and then, so that's two fingers of ginger. And I'm going to put a quarter cup of sugar. And the reason that this jar is oversized is because you're going to feed it every day. Um, so quarter cup, a little bit more, a little bit less is fine. This is not precise science. Now I'm going to add, I'm going to fill this thing halfway full with water. I'm going to give it a shake. And I'm going to put that in a cool spot without sunlight. Um, and I'm going to agitate this every few days because you can't fully see it. But even within a few seconds, sugar starts settling to the bottom. Um, now, every day you want to add another uh, quarter cup of sugar and, and a finger of garlic. Uh, garlic, wow, you could add garlic. That would be a very different thing. And I wanna talk about that in a minute because you can really ferment anything you want here in a lot of these same mechanisms. Um, but back to the actual ferment, you, you want to take every day for seven days, you wanna take a finger of ginger and you wanna take a quarter cup of sugar. You wanna add it and give it a little shake and put it back in its cool place to rest. Um, if you see foaming at the top, that is great. That means that the bacteria is eating the sugar and turning it into more bacteria and then into a small amount of alcohol. This is going to end up at about 1% alcohol if you follow those proportions. Um, I'm not teaching you how to make um, how to make bathtub hooch here, but the reality is most bacteria put off some amount of alcohol. Um, so how much time do I have? Uh, you have 10 minutes. Perfect. Well, just a okay. little class, so right up, right about 10 minutes. Okay, hey, just real so, quick, I have a question uh, from somebody about the, uh, will you be sharing the recipes and everything on, uh, on Twitter? Yes, I will. Um, I'll, I'll put up a slide at the, the end with my uh, website and um, some high level, um, yeah, some high level recipes. My, I had more slides in all honesty, but my computer, I decided not to save them. Apparently my computer decided to update and um, here I am. Half so that's why I'm all demo. You're good. Thanks. So um, yeah, so so this, you, you could honestly do a lot of things with this. I've done turmeric in the same exact way. I've actually, I joked about it earlier, but I've heard of people doing garlic in the same way. This is a beverage. I would not recommend you doing that. Um, it may be good for some sort of wacky cleanse that you may want to do. Um, someone may tell you it cures the coronavirus. It probably doesn't. But the but this this is going to be a beverage. At the end of it, what you're going to do is you're going to take this and you're going to um, it, if you have the uh, flip top jars, you can strain this and fill and funnel it into one of those flip top jars and let it go for another week. Add, add a pinch of sugar, add maybe a half a tablespoon of sugar so that it has a little more to ferment um, and get effervescent. But if you don't, you can just pour this into another mason jar with a lid. Honestly, I have these plastic lids here. I don't recommend them. They don't have a seal. You can't see it, but I sprayed my arms already just in shaking. So um, metal lids are the are going to seal the most, the, the tightest there. So... Um, I hear some background noise there. Um, but now, okay, so another major ferment, um, you can do this with just about any vegetable or fruit, is um, an actual pickle, which the proportions on that are 2% salt by weight. Now, in most cases, if you don't actually have a scale, um, add somewhere between a tablespoon and a half and two tablespoons of of salt in a um, in a quart mason jar this size, and that's going to end up being close enough. If you go too little or too much, your your ferment is going to end up having some mold on it. Um, and in reality, if you open this up at the end and you see a thin layer of of white mold, it's actually fine. It's not. More, you know, it's gonna, it's one of the byproducts of fermentation. I'll skim it and you will be fine. If it is a string, the, the more exotic of the color, do not. Do not touch it. If it smells funny, 
do not drink it. Do not do not ever touch a ferment that has that that smells funny. That is the biggest thing. Trust your nose. Um, and, and funny is obviously subjective. If you think, hey, that may be funny, maybe go to an expert or someone who um, knows a little more. But so that 2% salt, and you can do so many things with that. If you top up a head of cabbage, you add 2% um, by weight salt to it, and you toss that, you have sauerkraut. And then you put a, a weight on it, and you let that go for a few weeks, you have sauerkraut. You can do the same with pickles. You can, but... You you know um you could do, you could pickle so many things you can pickle ginger onions you can um honestly I've picked I've in that same exact method I've pickled um oranges and it sounds weird as hell but it's just in this time where you're eating the same thing day in day out adding a new taste that you haven't tasted before is kind of fun and I I'm enjoying it my kids are enjoying enjoying it um. If you have um, apple cider vinegar, I, I like on a lot of my ferments to pour not not in a beverage like this, but in a in a pickle. I would pour just a little bit of apple cider vinegar on the top, not agitate it, and then that kind of perform, forms a protective layer. That's especially if you haven't done a lot of fermenting in your house, you don't know what the bacteria is going to be like. Um, that kind of just gives that barrier. The other thing is um, preserved fruit. Right now we have, um, I have 26 fruit trees on the property here um, on a quarter acre actually. Uh, neighbors love it. Uh, <laughs> no, they don't. Um, neighbor kids love it because they, they get fruit and all that. But So we have kumquats um, and you salt pack those, literally kumquats in salt. And it's it, there's an Egyptian word for it. They do it with uh, key lime, but it's just delicious. It's, it's a way that you've never had um, citrus before and it's great on a salad meat dish for that kind of brightness so um okay that is pretty much my time were there other questions yeah. aside from slides and things that I'll, i will post yeah totally um so I, i'm gonna I, i'm gonna rattle these off here just without you answering because uh, just in the interest of time um and i apologize i'll miss uh, miss a couple of uh, questions here for folks um, but uh, one of the questions is, do you recommend making uh, or using screw top jars uh, for all pickling or is there a time and a place for a mason jar? Um, there are others folks asking, can you combine ingredients, uh, ginger and lemon? Uh, lots of folks asking for recipes. I pointed them, said you, you know, certainly post the website, um, but uh, also follow Homebrew Sec on uh, Twitter. And I have no doubt you'll be tweeting out the link to that website uh, after we're down. Um, and uh, <clears throat> hold me honest to that. Um, or pop that up there. Uh, and uh, what's the form of pickling you do the most? Lots of folks asking for recipes and some folks asking for PowerShell resources, right? So um, it yeah. looks like your slides and resources going up at homebrewsec.com. And this has been outstanding. Thank you so much. It was great. Do, do and there were some people when... answer some of those questions in broad or should I just take that offline? Yeah, I, just, I, I would take that offline for sure because yeah, we're getting ready to roll. But I, I think there's just too many. Yeah. Um, the big absolutely. thing is there was one person that mentioned Twitter and they say they don't have Twitter. That's fine. Um, if you don't have Twitter, that's not that big of a deal. Uh, you can still access his Twitter feed uh, just from a browser. Yeah. And I'm going to try and cross post a lot of it, this stuff in blog form. It's It's been clear to me that more hackers than I thought are interested in um, pickling, which to me is just hacking vegetables and hacking fruit. Um, it's getting it to do something that you've never gotten it to do before. Um, so I, it makes me realize that I should go a lot more of the pickling and fermenting route on my blog and on my uh, on my Twitter. So I will definitely do that since apparently people are interested. <laughs>